A few weeks ago, yes, I am late to this, a tweet from Jake Lucky was widely shared and responded to. It featured three somewhat closely timed comments from a few big content creators, specifically Hungrybox of Smash Brothers Melee fame, Dr. Disrespect, and Shroud. In Hbox's case, I'm pretty sure he was specifically talking about reveals at the Game Awards, but in a general sense, all three more or less stated the same thing. They are tired of seeing or playing samey, unfun games. For some, it may sound like a reasonable complaint, but for many people who responded to this tweet, it isn't. Because contrary to those complaints, there's actually a remarkable abundance of worthwhile games to try. And that is absolutely true. For many years now, every once in a while, I've seen the complaint of, there's just nothing to play or some kind of variation of that statement. Perhaps 18 or more years ago, it really was an understandable grievance to have, because back then, the only games you really heard about were either in physical magazines you might have a subscription to, or, for the less invested, ones that got a marketing budget to actually get television commercials. Otherwise, you pretty much had to rely on word of mouth from your own friends or on the internet, and access to which was not as widespread then. But as the years passed, the internet started showing up everywhere, to the point where we could browse it on our cell phones. Technology used for game development also became more robust and more accessible, especially for independent game development. Those two factors combined with the creation of digital gaming storefronts on consoles and social media making word of mouth easier than ever, meant that the door for greater discoverability was opened. Today, a game development team of any size can download a number of any free-to-use game engines, begin production on their project, and then publish and distribute it all by themselves across all available platforms. Steam, GOG, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live Marketplace, Nintendo eShop, Android, and iOS, and possibly get the existence of their games shared by thousands and thousands of people who stumbled upon and loved it. A game with little to no budget has the potential to be seen by a huge number of eyes just through word of mouth. For example, Among Us first released in 2018 and was out for two years before it saw the gigantic resurgence in 2020 that we all watched it receive. And more recently, we saw the likes of Vampire Survivors absolutely explode in popularity due to its simplicity and sheer addictiveness. And this discoverability isn't a massive boon only for indie games either. It also helps obscure or niche double-A games that might have bombed if not for that extra bit of exposure. And it helps older games that previously went unnoticed receive a second wind. While it might have been a reasonable thing nearly two decades ago, today the statement of there's just nothing to play is no longer an opinion, it's just a flat-out falsehood. Not only is there an incredible selection of games to play at any moment, I think it's safe to say that we're living in the greatest era of video game creation ever. And it's only getting better because that accessible and robust technology I mentioned a minute ago is only getting more accessible and more robust. But why do people still keep saying it? From the random people online to the big streamers who play games for a living, why do some find themselves in this fantasy world where there just aren't any games to play. In the case of streamers specifically, it's more a matter of livelihood, as it might be difficult to break away from the handful of games they're most commonly associated with because they know that if they dare try to play something else, they'll only get a fraction of the viewership, which then cuts into their income. It's an unattractive prospect even when the games they are currently playing just aren't fun anymore. But at the same time, I think a lot of streamers don't seem to realize that a pretty significant chunk of their viewers, maybe not necessarily more than half but a sizable amount, are there for them, the streamer, and not just the game they're playing. They don't always want to see the game itself, they want to see the streamer specifically play it. I understand the risk of suddenly switching from a specialist streamer to a variety one, but it could be the refresh they need for themselves and their viewers. And who knows, it might get those viewers to play games they might not have glanced at otherwise. Now, moving on to a broader scope that includes everyone, I think there's a few more factors at play. 
First, there's the fact that a lot of people simply don't know how vast the current state of gaming is. They're not actively ignoring it, they're just totally unaware. That's all. They're not uncaring, they're just ignorant, and ignorance can be resolved. Second, there's the commonly held belief that even though indie development is as open and free as it is, it's still very much a triple-A realm we live in. Franchises that are at the top of the food chain tend to stay there so long as there's even a modicum of developer competence and player loyalty left. It's not a challenge for the biggest names to stay big. In the case of annual or biannual series, like sports games or Call of Duty, they could release several complete dumpster fires in a row and still rebound on the next one so long as it's just decent. Thus, these big names continue to dominate and draw the most attention to themselves. Third, we're also still living in a period where a good amount of casual gamers still side-eye indie games with some reluctance. They might have a willingness to try an indie game, but some hear the word indie and still inflict a negative association to it, assuming that the game must be boringly simplistic, barely functional, pretentious, or ugly, even though the most successful indie games are anything but. And that last descriptor, ugly, that's a big one that stops a lot of people from trying truly incredible games of smaller budgets and resources because so many people are so used to those AAA games that reek of big money that they think anything else with muddy textures, low polygon counts, or 2D sprites must be old and inferior, even if it's on purpose and regardless of how eye-catching the art direction may be. And the fourth reason why people say there's no games to play is simply because some just straight up don't have that willingness to try anything other than the handful of AAA franchises they're already familiar with. Breaking out of your usual comfort zone and expanding your taste to be more eclectic is something that the individual has to decide to do for themselves. And a lot of people sadly don't want that. Sometimes it's genuinely because they don't have the time or money to begin that journey. But other times it's because of just pure, unmovable apathy. It sucks, but it's true. Some people don't want to explore and refuse to budge from their tiny bubble of familiarity which is not inherently bad. But it does look strange once they decide that they're no longer happy inside that bubble, yet still refuse to leave it. I understand that some experiences offered by certain AAA games just can't be replicated to a sufficiently comparable degree within the indie or even AA space, because they just don't have the resources for it. For example, no indie dev has the manpower or the money to make the perfect Call of Duty substitute. At least not one that has multiplayer and zombies and a highly cinematic campaign. I get it. And that chokehold that one franchise can have over an entire community is one problem. Another problem is the individual's active refusal to just play something that isn't trying to be Call of Duty. There's a whole world of interesting games out there to try. You don't need to abandon Call of Duty just to end up searching for another Call of Duty. That is a shackle that you made, and you're the only one who can free yourself from it. You have the willingness to break away, you just need to commit to it fully. I know it's a hard frame of mind to get out of, especially when you spend so many years feeling perfectly content with it. You play a handful of different franchises that pump out decent to great games every year or two, and then suddenly, they become bad and seemingly stay bad, showing no signs of getting better or even resembling the experience that hooked you in to begin with. You stay within this boundary and hope it gets better, or you try to push outward and explore a bit, trying more games you might have heard about in passing or maybe never heard of at all until you saw it just now on the PlayStation Store or something. It is risky because every new game is also a new potential disappointment for one reason or another, but it's also a potentially big reward, and I think a lot of hesitant people don't fully grasp that. That game that you've been glancing at for the last week, that game that looks kinda interesting but still different from what you usually play, it could be your next favorite. It could be the game that opens your eyes to a completely new world of video games you never even thought about before. In the best case scenario, you find your new obsession, 
and it leads you to playing even more great titles of comparable quality in the same genre or style. You discover a new passion that you devote yourself to for the next few weeks, months, or even years. That's the potential reward we're talking about. It is a high bar, yes, but if a game manages to reach it, then playing it will feel like one of the best decisions you have made in a long time. Worst case scenario though, the game sucks and you're out 10 to $60 depending on if you bought it on sale or not. That's it. It's annoying, yes, but the world's not gonna end. Basically, a fantastic game will likely have much more of a positive impact on you than a bad game has a negative one. And I have my own personal experience that supports this. Hear me out. Admittedly, I am not one of those individuals who is completely beholden to just two or three franchises. I do have some favorites, yes, but generally speaking, I like a lot of stuff. Partly because, as a kid, I bought anything with cool cover art, and thanks in no small part to being old enough to have experienced the magic of physical game rental stores that allowed me to dip my toes into any game I wanted without committing to a full purchase. This is actually how I played Metal Gear Solid for the first time, but even then, I still took some risks. As you may imagine, I've played some pretty big stinkers here and there growing up, but today, I only vaguely recall any of them. I'm sure I could have ranted about some of them at length if you asked me my opinion way back then, but they've made no meaningful impact on me on the long run. Later, into early adulthood in 2011, when rental stores were in the process of nearing extinction, I began to rely on Amazon, which is where I could buy up random games at cheap prices and keep them now. One game was a big risk in particular, and for a couple of reasons. Yakuza 3. First, it was the third game in the series. I'm a person who prefers to jump in at the start, but copies of Yakuza 1 and 2 on the PlayStation 2 were rare, and going for above what I was willing to pay around this time. Second, I barely knew a single goddamn thing about the Yakuza series, and this was long before it had the popularity it has today, so gameplay videos were not abundant, and I didn't want to spoil myself by watching too much. I only had reviews and word of mouth to guide my hand here, and from what I could tell, they were very positive. So I said fuck it, and I bought Yakuza 3 for the PlayStation 3 with no prior experience with the series at all. Thankfully, the game had a video summary of the previous two entries, so I wasn't totally in the dark about where the story was. Beyond that though, I just went with the flow. And guess what? I loved it. I loved it so much that I bought Yakuza 4 as soon as I could, and even the zombie apocalypse spin-off, Dead Souls. I was one of the fans who was loudly campaigning to have Yakuza 5 localized, and I've been a fan of the franchise and the developer, Ryugagotoku Studio, ever since. Yakuza 3 was a risky purchase for me back in 2011. It could have ended up being a tiny footnote in my life as a game that I disliked and tossed to the side, but it didn't. Purchasing that game ended up being one of the best decisions I ever made, because now I have a big collection of Yakuza games in my home and I love them all, to varying degrees. I took a chance on a game I knew fuck all about, and now I'm a die-hard fan. I don't regret it a single bit. I want other people to experience this feeling. I want other people to dive headfirst into something unknown and discover a new favorite they never knew they wanted before, because it feels fucking awesome. But, as with a lot of attempts to change one's habits or ways of thinking, the hardest part is the beginning. Where do you even start? How does one even go about finding niche or indie games to try? I said to dive head first, but into which pool? That's a fair question, and this is how it gets a bit complicated because there's really not any single resource that has all the answers. But there are multiple methods which you can combine to make things easier. First, if you want to get to the real nitty gritty and cut the bullshit and go straight to discovering the best of the best, I recommend checking out OpenCritic, which is a review aggregate like Metacritic, but dedicated entirely to video games. As of writing this video, the GOG Winter Sale is happening, and they have a section at the very top of the homepage that lists games that are on sale, plus their OpenCritic score 
and links to their GOG store page. Scroll down a bit and you'll see other sections they usually have, like popular games, recently released, the 2022 Hall of Fame, featured games, and various others. Then, if you want more control over what to look for and a greater selection, I would say that the most painless and accessible way is to just open up the digital storefront of your choice and just start browsing. More specifically, I would say that Steam is the best place to do this, even if you only play on consoles, because Steam has very robust methods of sorting the entire store by genre, price, and tags. And generally speaking, a lot of niche or indie games that are on Steam are likely to be on console too. So personally, I would suggest going on Steam and looking up genres or specific tags that catch your eye, regardless of the platform you actually play on. After that, you might want to look for websites that dedicate themselves to indie or niche AA games. And I have a couple of them in mind. First, for indies, there's itch.io, which is basically Bandcamp but for indie games, to the point where some of these games might not even be on Steam at all. If you really want to see the games made with little to no budget or resources, or perhaps made by a one-man team or something, this would be the website to check out and browse. Now, if you're interested in stuff that has a little more resources put into them, then I would actually recommend the news website, Gamatsu.com. This place is a great resource for the side of the spectrum that's more about ambitious indies or niche AA titles that have the budget and manpower for high quality gameplay, but not the budget for ridiculous marketing. I estimate that every couple of weeks or so, I see another game on this site that I hadn't been aware of before, but decide to keep an eye on. While it does have a bit of a slant towards Japanese games, it still covers games from all over the world, by developers based in Europe and South America, for example. So if this type of game is more your speed, I suggest bookmarking Gamatsu, or following the official Twitter account. Now, even if you do all three of these things, check out OpenCritic, scour Steam, and regularly peek at Gamatsu, some games might still fly under your radar. And ultimately, it all boils down to having it show up in front of you by coincidence, usually through social media word of mouth, or maybe someone you already know just so happens to recommend it to you directly. Fact of the matter is, this is because there's a ton of games out there, contrary to what some people say, and it's basically impossible to keep up with literally everything unless it's your job or something, but even then, it's a lot of plates to spin. So, to help out even further and get you started in a certain direction, I'm just going to go ahead and throw out some of my own recommendations. I'll be covering both indie games and AA games by established companies. And I'll be upfront and say that if you've already heard of or played most of the games that I'm about to mention, then chances are you don't need any additional direction for finding niche or indie games to try. This is just for people who have passing or minimal experience with the space. So, I've already mentioned the likes of Vampire Survivors, which is a super addicting game you can play for as little as 15 minutes or up to several hours in a session. It's easy to learn and get into, and extremely rewarding. Plus, it just released on Android and iOS. If you like fast-paced arcade games that test your reflexes and your ability to overcome sensory overload, then I recommend Mushihime-sama, a vibrant, challenging, and fun bullet hell with leaderboards and several different game modes. The game's developer, Cave, has several other bullet hells available on Steam as well. If you're interested in survival horror games but have already exhausted your Resident Evil backlog, then check out the recently released Signalis, a gorgeous and mysterious sci-fi horror game that checks off all the important boxes of a true survival horror experience. Open map design with lots of rooms to encourage exploration, plenty of puzzles, and strict resource management that constantly brings up the dilemma of choosing which enemies to spend precious bullets on, or try to run past. There's also Tormented Souls, which is a very clear throwback to those older survival horror games. It was actually in my honorable mentions for my top 5 games of 2021 list. There's also Nightmare of Decay an excellent first-person survival horror throwback, too. If you like first-person shooters, then man, you're in luck, because there is no shortage of them. There's Dusk, which is heavily inspired by Quake, Amid Evil, which is heavily inspired by Hexen and Heretic, 
Proteus, which is heavily inspired by Doom, Metal Hellsinger, a fast-paced FPS rhythm game with a kick-ass soundtrack featuring vocalists from a bunch of different metal bands, and if you want genuine early 2000s running and gunning, there's Painkiller and the Serious Sam games. If you would like a realistic and hardcore online World War II shooter, there's Hell Let Loose. Or maybe you want a highly tactical co-op game. If so, check out Ground Branch, made by developers of the original Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon games. There's also Ready or Not, which is the spiritual successor to the SWAT series. Do you like RPGs? Because there's a lot there too. If you want action RPGs like Diablo, check out Torchlight 2, Grim Dawn, or Path of Exile, the last of which is free to play. If you want Japanese action RPGs, I recommend the East series by Falcom, which has really snappy and fun combat. There's also the Tales series from Bandai Namco, with equally satisfying and engrossing real-time gameplay. If you want more traditional CRPGs with turn-based or real-time with pause combat, check out Divinity 2, Wasteland 3, or Pathfinder Kingmaker. All lore-heavy games with interesting worlds and characters. If you want a first-person RPG, particularly one that's set in a real, historical location, check out Kingdom Come Deliverance. Maybe you're familiar with Bioware RPGs like Mass Effect and Dragon Age, but don't want to wait any longer for the next installments of those series. In which case, I recommend Greedfall, which might have its own fair share of jank, but also has solid combat and serious themes, focusing heavily on politics, religion, and commerce. If you want a sandbox RPG where you play however you want and amass a kingdom of your own, check out the recently released Mount and Blade Bannerlord. And of course, if you're interested in the idea of an RPG that's entirely based around dialogue and not combat, check out Disco Elysium. It has an incredible script dripping with wit and humor, and there's a ton of ways to play. There's also the newly released Pentiment, which I reviewed. It's not so much an RPG as it is a mystery adventure game with a fuck ton of dialogue choices that impact the story. In that same vein, there's The Forgotten City, which goes even further back into history and even features a neat time loop gimmick. Or maybe you want to embrace the indie scene a bit more and its penchant for Metroidvanias, because there's another huge selection there. There's Hollow Knight, which many consider to be a genuinely perfect game, there's Dead Cells, Rogue Legacy, and Blasphemous, the last of which has insanely cool, religiously inspired, dark fantasy art direction. These games are not only great to look at, but they're great to play, and combat is a huge part of the experience. Speaking of combat, maybe you're interested in heavily skill-based hack-and-slash games, referred to as character action. If so, and you've already run your course with Devil May Cry, Bayonetta, and Metal Gear Rising, I recommend Assault Spy and Mitsurugi Kamui Hikae. The latter is a very small game with only a handful of stages and enemy types, but the combat is very well thought out and will take a lot of practice to master. If you want shooting in your character action games, then check out Vanquish, Ultra Kill, or the recently released Evil West. Perhaps the more hardcore among you might be thinking, but I want something that can drag hundreds of playtime hours out of me. I want one game that I'll be obsessed with for months. Well, there's a few of those around too. Colony simulation games are notorious time sinks. RimWorld, and the most recently complete, Dwarf Fortress can absolutely steal your life away. And there's automation and resource management games like Factorio or Satisfactory. Look at the user reviews for these games and you'll immediately spot people with hundreds, maybe even thousands of playtime hours invested. And obviously, there's the realm of MMOs. And the top dog at the moment is none other than Final Fantasy XIV. And it's top dog for a good reason. While A Realm Reborn content is fairly standard but competent MMORPG stuff, it turns from a good MMO to a great Final Fantasy once you hit the first expansion. Heavensward, which is accessible for free in the free trial. And the game is receiving more and more updates to facilitate single-player gaming so that a person can do all story-related content without needing to party up with others. 
And even if you're not interested in 14 for some reason, there's Elder Scrolls Online, Guild Wars 2, and Final Fantasy 11, which is coming up on 20 years old and still getting content updates. Maybe you want something competitive, with deep mechanics that takes a lot of practice to perfect. Well, there's no better time than now to hop into fighting games. The big franchises are becoming more stuffed with worthwhile single-player content and learning resources, so getting the basics isn't actively aggravating. Street Fighter VI is on the horizon and looks incredible, with Tekken 8 not far behind. Guilty Gear Strive is still bustling with activity online. The King of Fighters 15 is probably the best the series has ever been and has a very international following. If you're interested in older fighting games, there's also Fightcade, an application that functions as a matchmaking client using emulation to play older fighting games that never had online functionality, and letting you play online with them. And it works excellently. If you want to experience independent or niche fighting games, check out Them's Fightin' Herds or Melty Blood Type Lumina. Yes, the former is inspired by My Little Pony, but for a long time, it still put the big franchises to shame with how good it is mechanically and how reliable its online functionalities are. Don't scoff at it because of its art style, because it had more heart and thought put into it than the first two years of Street Fighter V. Other random recommendations I can give are Hades, a really fun and beautiful roguelite by the very reliable and talented Supergiant Games. Inscription, a surprisingly intense, spooky, and story-rich roguelite card game. Deep Rock Galactic, a co-op first-person shooter where you just dig caves and shoot monsters with friends. Earth Defense Force, a sci-fi B-movie in video game form where you take on hordes of giant insects and alien frogmen in a huge destructive environment. Hard Space Shipbreaker, which is a physics-heavy simulation game where you destroy and salvage spaceships. Orcs Must Die, an action tower defense game where you set traps to create complex kill boxes to decimate massive hordes of orcs. 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, which is the game that you're currently seeing on screen, has one of the best and most dense sci-fi stories I have ever experienced in any medium. And so, so much more. And this is all just stuff that released somewhat recently. I haven't even gotten into older classics from decades past. Basically, there's no end to the amount of games you can play. It's easy to assume you might not like them just because you never tried them before, so why bother starting now? But the thing is, now is the perfect time to start, because we're seeing indie or niche AA games try to push boundaries, blend genres, appeal to obscure fan bases, and explore new and interesting concepts, while many AAA blockbusters are complacent in the formula they've been leaning on as a crutch for years now. Video games are flourishing at all levels, and it would be foolish to not take advantage. Go and explore. Try new games. Dive into stuff with or without any knowledge. Worst case, you dislike the game, toss it aside, and move on to the next. Best case, you find a new favorite that becomes a part of your life for years to come. And that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. This concludes my thoughts on the idea of there's just nothing to play. I hope I didn't sound too preachy. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.